Hello, thank you for joining us. It's so good to be with you today, whether you're, I don't know, cooking, walking the dog, uh, driving somewhere, just sitting at a desk, ready to take notes. However you're engaging with us today, it's just good to do this together in any way that's safe. So thanks so much. I can imagine that you had the cure to a pandemic. Imagine a pandemic that's, you know, universal. Everybody has it. It's terminal. It's a horrible disease. But uh, it's kind of a high-functioning thing where the symptoms are sort of subtle and uh, just enough that you could maybe plausibly believe you didn't have it. Um, so you've got the cure, but people aren't sure they have the disease. Um, what good would a cure be without accepting the diagnosis? Diagnosis. We're learning about Jesus as the great physician in this series from uh, Dr. Luke. Uh, history says Luke, the, uh, the third evangelist, was a physician. And he's telling us that Jesus is not only the great physician, but he's the cure, the cure itself. But Jesus brings a scandalous diagnosis. We don't always accept it. So in the text that we just read, Jesus is uh, walking through town and he sees a tax collector. It says he saw a tax collector. That's Luke chapter 5, verse uh, 27. And that word saw is like stronger than that. It means really like looked. He looked. He looked at. He looked intently at, or as one commentator says, it's like he looked into Levi, the tax collector, or looked through him. Kind of like a diagnostic scan, like he's running a full body, full spirit, full life scan on Levi. What's inside of this guy? We don't get the diagnosis immediately, but it comes, and it comes both for Levi and the Pharisee at the end of, of the story here in the account, verse uh, 31. Those who are well have no need of, the, of a physician, Jesus says, but those who are sick. I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners. To repentance. And there it is. Sinners. A word you probably don't hear very often. Um, seriously, it, uh, anyways. That's the diagnosis. Now, when he talks about sinners, he's not talking about just about actions or sins. He's talking about a condition. Uh, sinner. This is a disease. And everybody has it. There's, there's something endemic about it in, in the human race. And I'm reminded of the uh, New Yorker cartoon where a young student comes before his father and she holds up his his report card, and it's got all D's and F's on it. And he said, so, Dad, you know, what do you think? Heredity or environment, right? We'd love to be able to blame this on somebody else and say, well, you know, it's, it's a condition. But we do bear responsibility. As Shakespeare says in Julius Caesar, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Uh, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. It's a condition. It's a, a disease in human nature at this point in history. Now, uh, I know this isn't the easiest pill to swallow right at the beginning of a message, uh, but it's important for us to understand this, particularly in our national conversation where we're all yearning for a, a corporate healing in our nation and world. Uh, we want to set beside our idealism a heavy dose of realism. This is what Jesus does. C.E.M. Jode in the last century uh, wrote, it, it was because we rejected the doctrine of original sin that we on the left were always being so disappointed. I find this interesting. He, he writes, disappointed by the refusal of people to be reasonable, by the behavior of nations and politicians, above all, by the recurrent fact of war. You can't ultimately hide the reality that the world is broken and that we're a part of that brokenness human beings. I, I love the realism of the Bible, the realism of Jesus. This is the diagnosis of the great physician and indeed the whole Bible. So we read uh, in, in, even in Eden, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die, the Lord says to the first humans, Genesis 2, 17. And we eat again and again and again. We know we shouldn't, but we eat and it creates sickness. And the Lord again says to Israel, ancient Israel, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick, who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. It's so deceitful. The heart's so sick, it it's deceives us as to the, the nature of this disease. 
And then to Christians, the Apostle Paul says, for I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. Romans 7, 18. Now that's the St. Paul speaking there. I find great comfort in this. Even he says, I, can, I know what's right, but I can't always get myself uh, to do it. Scandalous diagnosis. But here's what's interesting. The scandal attracts some people, even as it repels others. Some people are actually attracted to this thing that scandalizes others. Now, why? Think of the characters that we have here, Levi and this other group called the Pharisees. What is it about Levi that in the face of this diagnosis, he's drawn to Jesus? I mean, Jesus walks by and he says, Levi, you know, follow me. That's all he says, right? And Levi just gets up and leaves everything and he follows Jesus. He's drawn to Jesus. And then he goes and he has a huge banquet. He gets all of his other tax collector friends. He's, hey, come on, you got to meet this guy. And they have a festival and they drink and they eat and they laugh. And there's great joy at this table of Levi in the presence of Jesus. And they're drawn to this Jesus, this real Jesus. But on the other hand, you've got these the Pharisees and, and they, they, they complain or they grumble and like, who is this? What's going on here? You know, this isn't right. And it's ironic because here, the, the, these people supposedly believe in sin. You'd think they would be on board with this, this diagnosis, but there's something, it's like they're the anti-party to the party that Levi is having. Now, what, 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 is, what is going on there? I wish we could pretend we don't know, but I think we know, at least I know, because I've got one of each of these inside of me. I've got a Levi there and I've got a little Pharisee in there. And the Pharisee is the one that I hope shows up when I come to Jesus, right? The one that makes me look good, like I'm always doing the right thing and trying real hard. But unfortunately, oftentimes it's the Levi that, that shows up, whether it's uh, with Jesus or at a party. They're both there. And both of these tend to break us into groups in society as well. I mean, you see that dynamic in this story where basically the Pharisees at least, and I think probably also tax collectors are saying, hey, if you're not uh, with one of us, you're one of them. And if you're with them, you can't also be with us. And as soon as I, I think that thought, I realize, okay, this isn't just a religious dynamic. This is a secular dynamic as well. I mean, this is the dynamic that we're experiencing right now in our world, um, in our social media feeds, at our kitchen tables, in boardrooms, classrooms, and uh, state capitals. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the thoughtful Russian novelist, writes, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. See what he's saying there. It's not an us versus them, good guys versus bad guys. The line dividing good and evil cuts through every human heart. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's, he's, everybody's infected. That's the diagnosis, sin. But I have a cure and this cure is for everybody. So just pa let's pause for a second here. Let me invite you to think about this. Put yourself in that incident with Levi and the Pharisees and Jesus and ask yourself, where am I in this story? Who do I relate to? How do I respond to Jesus' diagnosis? Think about that. Because I, I would suggest either you will be working on your own righteousness in life, or you will be working out of the righteousness of Jesus. Now hold on to that thought, because I'm going to come back to it and explain it. But Not long ago, I was reading an article by a guy named Dean and Sarah, uh, and he's writing this article about what he calls unsaved Christians. And it was kind of a head spinner. You're like, wait a minute, what do you mean by unsaved Christians? Is there such a thing? Well, he's talking about what he calls, quote, cultural Christianity. And this is really the difference between Levi and the Pharisee, uh, what he calls cultural Christianity. What happens when you and I have a version of Jesus in our minds that isn't actually the true Jesus? We talked a little bit about this last week. Remember when we were talking about the white nationalist quote unquote Jesus that isn't really Jesus at all? Well, there are lots of versions of this, right? There's the, it's all good quote unquote Jesus or the, you gotta be good quote unquote Jesus. What happens if our idea of who Jesus is doesn't match up with the reality of who he actually is? Well, you get up with what Dean and Sarah calls cultural Christianity. And Jesus addresses this, this uh, dynamic. In fact, if you look in the very next chapter, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus asks one of his penetrating questions. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, 
and do not do what I say. That's interesting. Now you ask yourself, well, who is he talking to there? Is he talking to Levi or people like Levi, tax collectors, you know, and sinners, quote unquote? Or is he talking about, or is he talking to Pharisees and so-called, you know, religious people? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Well, you get a little bit of insight into who he's speaking to if you look at the version of that in St. Matthew. So it might be even interesting to flip over. If you've got your Bible out, you might just navigate over to, to Matthew uh, chapter 8, verse 21. He's, here Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the, the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And then verse 22, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we, pro- not, did we not prophesy in your name? and cast out demons in your name, and do many deeds of power in your name. Jesus says, then I will declare to them, I never never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Now, he realizes he says this in love. He's really trying to push the question of, do you know the real, do you know who I really am? I don't want to get to the place where I ever have to say to you, you didn't know me, and I didn't know you, we didn't have a relationship with one another. So, what's he talking about? Well, Notice what he says. Those people will say, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do deeds? He's talking about people who are trying to improve their own righteousness, who are trusting in their own righteousness. Now, immediately, if you're aware of the teaching of Luke's gospel and the whole Bible in in fact, you, you realize, okay, these people, they're in the wrong story. That's not the story that Jesus is telling us. The story of Jesus is never about what we have to do or what we do. It's about what he does, what he has done. See, see he, he's, he's saying this because he wants his followers to move from a world in which we do is central to a world in which what he does is central. Move from trusting in our own righteousness which, after all, he's claimed is infected, is mortally wounded, to his righteousness, which we find he gives us as a free gift of grace. So it's so important. Dean and Sarah says that when we think of ourselves, we don't fall into the trap of of being a, a cultural Christian that thinks our salvation comes from what we do. Because this is what's going on here. A cultural Christian, and he's, he's not talking to atheists. He's talking to people who affiliate with Jesus. And so, so does the cultural Christian. I, I affiliate with Jesus. What, what are you saying? I mean, didn't I join the church? Uh, didn't I give regularly? Didn't I say my prayers? Didn't I sing songs of love? Didn't I speak against evil? Didn't I vote my values? And Jesus might go, yeah, but you never knew me. All along, you were just managing symptoms like a Pharisee hoping no one would would notice. I mean, think about these two characters, Levi and the Pharisee. Levi tells me he started life with the best of intentions. God gave him one of the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, a little Jewish boy with a great future ahead of him. Um, But somewhere along the way, something went wrong. Through his choices or the choices of other people, probably both, he ends up in a really seedy world. And he doesn't need anybody to tell him any day of the week that the world is not the way it's supposed to be and that he's not the way it's supposed to be. That's just what happens when you're a tax collector. On the other hand, you have the, the Pharisee who also, probably good little Jewish girls and boys, launched into life with the best in, of intention by good parents, we can assume. But somewhere along the way, they began to believe their own press reports and, and see that maybe we could keep this sin sickness under control, managing the symptoms. They, they're able to present to the world a, 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 you know, a facade of goodness. And because they do, they start to believe that maybe, just maybe, they can be good enough to work their way into God's love. Jesus is saying, oh my goodness, That's not the story that you're in. I'm calling you, Jesus says, on the basis not of your righteousness, but on the basis of my righteousness. This is not about what you do. This is about what I did. This is the cure, friends. Please, don't miss the cure. That's at the heart of the gospel. 
It's not about you. It's about him, Jesus. It's about relaxing into the perfect work, the one act of obedience, which summarizes Jesus' whole life, that he offers to us, for us, to God on our behalf, the Father. So imagine two hospital beds. And I hope you're not in a hospital bed, but I know some of us are in hospital beds these days. So imagine you're in a hospital bed and you got all the stuff hooked up. The vital signs are chirping and beeping. At the end of your bed, there's a chart. It's hanging off a nail at the foot of the bed. And it says what's, what's wrong with you. And maybe some of it's just because of what happened to you, you know, and maybe some of it's because of what you did. You know, you maybe smoke a couple packs of cigarettes a day. or what. I mean, who knows, but you're sick. Well, now you look over and on the bed next to you, there's an, another person lying in that bed. This person appears perfectly healthy. In fact, if you look at their vital signs, everything's just right in the range, right in the center of the range. And you read the, the chart at the end of that bed and everything is just perfect. Who's that in that bed? That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And so what Jesus is saying to us essentially is, listen, let me get out of my bed, take my chart and take your chart and swap them. This is the great exchange, as John Calvin calls it. This is the heart of the gospel. He's the cure. He only describes the diagnosis so that we will understand that he's the cure. Let me try and get at this another way. In 1518, Martin Luther, the great German reformer, preached a sermon, a, a, a earth-shattering sermon as far as I'm concerned. It's called A Sermon on Two Kinds of Righteousness. You can read it. And in this sermon, he dis distinguishes between two kinds of righteousness. One he calls our proper righteousness, and the other he calls our alien righteousness. What's he mean by that? Well, your, your proper righteousness, he's using the word proper like uh, in the old English sense of that which belongs to you. So your proper righteousness is the righteousness that belongs to you because it's what you've done with your life. It's the choices that you've made or do make. That's your proper righteousness. Good or bad or both. Your alien righteousness is righteousness that's also yours, but it comes to you from outside of you. It's not the product of what you do or don't do. It's the product of what Jesus does or doesn't do. It's alien in the sense that it's foreign to you. The Latin for that is extra nos. It comes from outside of us. And it's just a gift. It's just a gift from God. See, that this is Romans 5 where... Jesus, the second Adam, uh, is perfectly obedient in every way, where Adam, the first Adam, failed. And as, as sin entered th through the first Adam, so righteousness and life enters through the second Adam. Elsewhere, Luther writes this, and I, this is a little bit of an extended quote, so if you'll bear with me, let me read this because I just love the language of this. This is Luther. He says, alien righteousness... That is the righteousness of another, instilled from without. This is the righteousness of Christ by which he justifies through faith. Therefore, we can with confidence, notice that word, confidence, boast in Christ and say, mine are Christ's living, doing and speaking. His suffering and dying, mine as much as if I had lived done, spoken, suffered, and died as he did. This is an act of faith. Everything, he writes, which Christ has as ours, graciously bestowed on us unworthy sinners out of God's sheer mercy. Although we have rather deserved wrath and condemnation and hell also, but through faith in Christ, faith in Christ, therefore Christ's righteousness becomes our righteousness. And all that he has becomes ours. Rather, he himself becomes ours oh my goodness this is the heart of the gospel would you just pause for a second and and reflect on that by faith all that Jesus Christ is and all that he has done becomes ours and so we stand not in our righteousness at all it's almost irrelevant because we have his righteousness his alien righteousness becomes our proper righteousness He's not talking. So this is, the, this is the scandal, right? Paul says, this is the scandal of the cross in Galatians 5.11. He, he says uh, in Romans 4.5, God justifies the ungodly. 
Now, that is a remarkable mind-bending statement that God justifies the ungodly. Everybody knows that Paul, the good Rabbi Saul of Tarsus, was going to finish that sentence by saying God justifies the righteous, right? We're talking about Pharisees. Paul says, no, God has chosen in his mysterious but beautiful grace to justify the ungodly, the unrighteous, the tax collectors, Levi, me, you. (laughs) This is the cure. So here's the point. Don't work on your own righteousness, but work out of the righteousness of Jesus. I mean, if you write anything down today, Please write that down. Don't work out of your own righteousness, but work out of the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus is saying, I have done this for you. I've done what I did for you in your spiritual sickness. I've done what you could never do, but I've done it for you. Now, someone's going to say, George, what about repentance? I mean, this is, is this just a get out of jail card free? Just get out of jail free card <laughs> What about repentance? Well, repentance means turning, and I'm glad you asked that question because Jesus does say that he's calling sinners for repentance, which means he's going to change your life when you let him do it. But not because you managed your symptoms or because you uh, upgraded or improved your righteousness or because you healed yourself, as we talked about. No, no, no. It's because you decided to stand in the righteousness of, of Jesus to receive his alien righteousness as a gift for you. And then you started to work out of it, to live your life out of that righteousness. You claim the alien righteousness and you live out of a righteousness that isn't yours by experience. It's yours by faith. Another way of saying that is this. You put Jesus between yourself and your challenges. You put Jesus between yourself And whatever your challenge is, and I don't know what your challenge is, and it might be a physical sickness, it it might be um, an addiction, it might be a set of relationships, it might be work stress or no work at all. I don't know what it is. He knows what it is. What this text is inviting us to do is to put Jesus in between you and that thing. And what I love about this story that Luke tells us, it's account of Jesus, there's there's a moment here, I'm back in Luke 5, Verse 31, where Jesus answers a question that was asked of someone else. Did you you notice that? There's a challenge. There's an attack, a verbal assault on the followers of Jesus. It comes from the Pharisees. And they're like, how how can you eat, drink with tax collectors and sinners? And they're looking at Jesus' followers. And Jesus answers the question. He steps in. He intercedes. He, He throws himself between his followers and those who bring a challenge against. And I love that about Jesus. That just says so much. It's a small gesture, but it just tells you who Jesus is. That when you're challenged by something, he wants to step between you and that challenge. He wants you to face that challenge through his righteousness. So let's just think about what that looks like. I mean, that's to see Jesus as an antibody, a body who stands against the sickness, or the challenge. Let me give you two examples of this, uh, personal healing and social healing. So this is what we all need, right? Personal healing is, is about our struggle with sin. And by the way, sin should be a struggle for all of us. Uh, the only surprise should be if you're not struggling against sin because then you're like a salmon that's not feeling the resistance of the river. It means you're a dead salmon, right? We're all should be struggling. There should be a sense of resistance against sin. That's what personal healing requires. And so put Jesus between you and your sin or your temptation. So let's think about shame for a second. I mean, if you're like me, you you know there's something you shouldn't do and you do it anyways, and then you feel horrible afterwards, right? So let Jesus respond for you. If you put him between you and that shame, let Jesus speak to the shame on your behalf. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to say, hey, shame, shame. George made a mistake, he failed, but I want you to tell, he failed at a point where I obeyed. I was pers- perfectly obedient with, with respect to that challenge. And so, shame, you have no claim on George. Oh, it's so good to hear that. That's what Jesus says, if you, try, if you stand in his alien righteousness. Or temptation, so this is 
sin that hasn't yet happened, but it's about to happen. And, it, and it, if you are like me, you know the kind of the power of, of, of temptations, like the power of inevitability, where you, you feel it so strongly, it's just going to have to happen. And you're almost better off getting sinning and then getting it behind you, right? No, that's not right. So what we do is we put Jesus between us and the temptation, and we let Jesus speak to the temptation that's addressing us, but he's going to step in and go, let me answer for George. And you listen in, and here's what he says to the temptation. He says the temptation, I have all the moral and spiritual strength to say no to you. And you listen in and you hear him say that. And then you, and, and, and he says, get thee behind me. And really what he says is get thee behind us. And hearing that, you know, now you, if you stand in his righteousness, have all the moral and spiritual strength to say no to that. You have his strength. Wow. So that's what happens when we claim that alien righteousness for ourselves in personal healing, uh, social healing. This is not about the struggle with sin so much as the struggle with sinners, right? Like everybody. So all other people. It, what happens when you put Jesus between yourself and other people? Well, you end up at a place like Levi's party where all kinds of people, the wrong kind of people, the us versus them are all you know, in the same place around a table where Jesus is present. This is a beautiful picture for us right now. And I want to tell you, that's us at UPC. If we're anything, we are a hospital for sinners. I love that. Bob Munger, one of our uh, pastors decades ago, said the church is the only fellowship in the world where the one requirement for membership is the unworthiness of the candidate. I mean, it, it, be less, you know, who's welcome at UPC? I would say anybody is welcome at UPC who comes as a sinner. That's who, that's who we are, a hospital for sinners. And notice the joy that's there at Levi's party. That's who they were as well. What if we engaged each other like that? With a spirit of humility and grace saying, I know, I know, I've got the same condition you've got, but I'm also living with the same cure that's available to you as well. Social healing. So let me say it one more, one more time. Don't work on your own righteousness, but work out of the righteousness of Jesus. Friend, if you haven't claimed that righteousness yet by faith in your life, I want to invite you to do it today. This cure, this Jesus, is available right now. And I would invite you to say yes to him. Jesus is saying in, in Luke chapter 4, he's saying to people, follow me. He says to Matthew, I mean to, uh, to Peter, follow me, all right, in the boat. And then to James and John, he says, follow me. And then uh, I believe to Peter's mother-in-law, whom he heals of a fever, follow me. And then he's saying, he, as we get to our text, to Levi, you follow me. And now he's saying to you, you follow me. Become my follower. Yoke yourself to me. Stand in my righteousness. Follow me. I mean, I want to ask you, what does that mean to you? What do you hear when Jesus says that to you? Do you hear Jesus saying, follow me from a distance and try your very hardest to become like me and try to match my goodness step for step and maybe one day you'll, you'll make it? Because if that's the way you hear that, you will never feel the confidence that Luther is talking about or the joy at the table of Levi. On the other hand, if you hear Jesus' call to follow me is a call to stand in that, in that righteousness, in his righteousness, stand in his hands as the one who brings you into the presence of God as a beloved child, then you can boast of your righteousness because it comes from Christ and it's perfect. So follow Jesus. Come to him. He's told us today that he comes not for the righteous, but for sinners. And if that feels like you, as it feels like me, I want you to say yes to Jesus today. Come to our website, upc.org slash Jesus. And please click one of the buttons. If you're live, click that button. If you're not, click the other one. Because we have a team of very friendly, warm spiritual advisors who would love to talk with you, interact with your questions, pray for you, and give you the assurance that this gift is yours. Let's not make this more complicated than it is. Uh, Jesus wants it to be easy. He's more interested in you just saying yes to him than we are. You know, let me close with this thought because that day when Jesus looked at Levi, I believe he didn't see a sinner. 
at all. Do you notice Jesus doesn't say anything about the scandalous diagnosis to Levi? He doesn't have to. Oh, Jesus sees him and he sees all about the sin, the sin inside of him. He, he knows the sickness is there. But he also sees the faith in him that he'll say yes someday at some moment. And he sees his own righteousness applied to Levi's life. He sees what the New Testament writers came to call a saint. And a saint didn't mean someone who didn't sin. Oh, no, no. A saint didn't mean someone who was perfect. A saint meant someone who stood in the alien righteousness of Christ and lived with confidence out of that. I believe Jesus says to him, or God the Father says to, to Levi, I see you, dear Le Levi, you are justified. I see you, you are justified. Where once a st sinner stood, now stands a saint. Because when I look at you, I see another with a capital A. And you know, Levi had another name. It was um, a name that's familiar to you. Because he would go on from this place to write the first account of Jesus' life. And we would come to know him. History would come to know him as Saint Matthew. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord Jesus, we bow before you acknowledging diagnosis is true for us as well but more importantly we acknowledge that you are the cure that we most desperately need and we thank you for coming on this rescue mission to sweep us into your healing embrace that it was your love for us that held you on the cross it was your love for us that pulled us through your tomb it was your embrace as you rise that gives us resurrection life and holds us at the right hand of the Father in blessedness and belovedness. This is our destiny to know we are your church, beloved sons and daughters. We thank you for this gift. Open to those who have not yet said yes, the clarity of the gospel, that they might step into the same joy and live with confidence in what you've done for us, not what we have to do for you. We pray this in Christ's name.